Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar presented by the Lieberthal Rogal Center for Chinese Studies. We're glad you can join us for a discussion of an important topic. Today's topic is China's proposed national security law and Hong Kong. What's happening now? My name is Twyla Tardif, and I am the incoming director of the Lieberthal Rogal Center for Chinese Studies and professor of psychology at the University of Michigan. Before we begin today, I'd like to inform the audience about two things. First of all, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the LRCCS website for future viewing. Secondly, we have a Q&A and after the speakers have finished, we will take some time to answer questions that have been written in from the audience. If you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom window. You should see at the bottom of your Zoom window a Q&A that you can type into and submit your questions to us. Feel free to write, into, write your questions throughout the webinar. You don't have to wait until the end to submit a question. During that Q&A, I will be reading the questions to the panel for them to answer. Unfortunately, we may not have time to answer all questions submitted, but we will do our best to do so. In addition, I'd like to take a moment to examine the background that I've chosen for this webinar. On this side, you see the logo and the seal of the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies, and on top is the title of today's webinar. But what I'd really like to draw your attention to is the photo in the middle. Move over for a minute so you can see that. Some of you may recognize this photo. Many of you probably will not. What you are looking at, in fact, is a very brief moment in Hong Kong's history, a moment that lasted about five seconds. It was July 1st, 1997, and in the few seconds just after midnight, the Hong Kong police changed their insignia and who they worked for. With impeccable coordination, police officers all over Hong Kong changed their badges from the Royal Hong Kong Police with English lettering only and what has descri been described as the picture of an opium boat sailing into Victoria Harbor to an etching of the modern sk skyline facing that harbor. Bilingual lettering, lettering with Chinese characters for Hong Kong appearing before the English and a bohinia flower, the symbol of the new Hong Kong sitting on top. In the words of retired Chief Superintendent Barry Smith, it was no dramatic change to how we did things or to the structure or the way people lived their lives. It was just another day. And somewhere above me up in the clouds, there'd been a change of government. Obviously, many things have changed before then. But I want to remind you of this day and remind you of the guarantees that were put before Hong Kong residents with the basic law. And among other things, they included freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of publication, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, and many others, including freedom of conscience and the right to strike. This is something that has been considered to be a difficult journey over the past decades. And what we will be talking about today is our different speakers' experiences and their learned opinions and, um, and walking through with us of the various events and the legal aspects to Article 23 and the proposed changes to that. So I'm now going to introduce each of our speakers in the order in which they'll be speaking. First up is Louisa Lim. And Louisa is a senior lecturer at the Center for Advancing Journalism at the University of Melbourne. She's a prolific journalist who was formerly the China correspondent for the BBC and now for NPR. Louisa is co-host co of the Little Red podcast, which provides fresh expert takes on China that go beyond the obvious. She's also author of The People's Republic of Amnesia. Tiananmen Revisited. Last year, she was a visiting fellow at Hong Kong University's Journalism and Media Studies Center. Louisa is joining us from Melbourne, Australia, where it's early in the morning, so we're doubly grateful for you being with us, Louisa. 
And my question to you, and I will share with everybody where I was during that fateful five seconds, um, was where were you on the day of the handover in 1997? Oh, thank you, Twyla. Um, on the day of the handover in 1997, I was actually uh, in the newsroom uh, at a local television station in Hong Kong where I was a reporter covering, covering the return to Chinese sovereignty um, from, from Hong Kong. Thank you. Speaking second today will be Martin Flaherty, the Leitner Family Professor of Law at Fordham Law School. And I apologize, Louisa, I was um, both listening to you at that time and I was outside, so I will talk about that in a moment, but um, thank you for covering that important time. Um, speaking second will be Martin Flaherty, the Leitner Family Professor of Law at Fordham Law School, as well as longtime visiting professor at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton. He's co-author of the 1990 report, One Country, Two Legal Systems, question mark, considering judicial independence in the wake of Hong Kong's handover to China. Currently, he's a part of a planned mission to Hong Kong with the New York City Bar Association on the same topic and is author of a recent book, Restoring the Global Judiciary, Why the Supreme Court Should Rule in Foreign Affairs. Martin is joining us from Princeton. Martin. Uh, I was saying um, where I was was a lot more boring than Louise I was or any of you. I was in New York parked in front of a TV watching with great interest what was going on. But one of the reasons for my keen interest was uh, I was preparing to teach um, in a few months at China University of Politics and Law in Beijing and then after that go to Hong Kong for a human rights mission to examine um, judicial independence. Thank you. Uh, third is Sharon Hom, the Executive Director of Human Rights in China. Sharon taught law for 18 years at City University of New York, where she is currently Professor of Law Emerita. And sh she spent 14 years, 14 of those years, training judges, lawyers, and legal personnel in mainland China. She's testified on a variety of human rights issues before key EU, US, and international policymakers, including think tanks and government bodies, and participated in five of the EU-China human rights legal seminars. Sharon has been a visiting professor at Hong Kong University Law School in 2019, at, where she was teaching human rights seminars during the 2019 protests. Sharon is currently joining us from New York. And Sharon, what were you during, doing during that moment in, of the handover? Uh, I had actually just come down from Beijing to uh, join my uh, almost seven Hong Kong aunties uh, and my relatives to watch the handover. So I guess at that moment, we were booing um, the terrible fireworks who were all just getting uh, soaked by, the, <laughs> by the, uh, the pouring rain. So we were watching the handover. Great. Thank you, Sharon. And our final speaker is Nicholas Housen, Pauli Tsang Professor of Law at the University of Michigan Law School. He spent a great many years living in the People's Republic of China, both as a scholar and as a practicing lawyer based in Beijing. He's been a consultant for the Chinese legislature and various PRC government ministries and administrative departments in connection with the drafting of PRC statutes and regulations. He acts as a Chinese law expert in the US and international litigation and or US government enforcement actions. Nico joins us from Ann Arbor. Nico, where were you during the handover? Uh, I was in uh, Tiananmen Square in Beijing, uh, one of what seemed like a million people. And it was actually the largest crowd that I'd seen in Tiananmen uh, after the night that uh, it was announced that Beijing had won the Olympics. Thank you. And thank you all. Um, we have a quite a large audience listening to the webinar live um, and we're looking forward to your questions. Um, I'm just going to also note as for myself, I, at that moment, I was actually a brand new assistant professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And at midnight, I was standing outside in Victoria Park listening to the festivities with thousands of other people, maybe hundreds of thousands, 
local residents, other expats, and many visitors who came just to witness this event was also getting soaked. Um, thank you, Sharon. It was a very wet week. And I had no idea that the badges were going to change. And more than the fireworks, the political discussions before, during, and after the handover, or the endless rain and heat of that week, I remember that moment when every officer reached into his or her pocket and replaced their badge. And as we know, it was a dramatic change. And so we're here today to listen to a number of experts who can tell us more about recent developments in this story of change. So let's turn now to the experts. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes, and after each of them has spoken individually, we'll have a group conversation and then address the audience questions. So as I mentioned before, our first speaker is Louisa Lim. Louisa, please go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to speak with such a distinguished panel. As I'm the only non-lawyer on the panel, I'll be taking the very broad and very shallow view. And I'll really be talking about how did we get to this moment. I'll be talking about the evolution of the movement. Um, so I grew up in Hong Kong. I'm writing a book about Hong Kong. And a year ago, I was in Hong Kong reporting on that one million person march. And I just remember particularly that day, June the 9th, standing on top of a flyover, looking down at just this endless sea of people, this sort of roar of sound that was rolling through the streets. And I do remember the mood that day, which was really a mood of jubilation and excitement of community, because before that moment, no one had known how many people would turn out. And on that particular day, there was this real sense of how can the voices of this many people be ignored? I mean, I think pretty very soon we saw the answer, which was really quite easily. Um, and it took four months till the end of October for the extradition legislation that the initial protest had been about to be withdrawn. But anyway, what I thought I'd do today, uh, in, because I got only 10 minutes, is kind of to do this um, by talking uh, through the evolution of the movement in seven protest slogans. So I'm going to try and uh, share my screen. Um, Let's hope this works. Um, so the first slogan that I think is so important for this protest was from July the 1st. Um, and it, this was the moment that protesters uh, um, broke into the Legislative Council building. And when you walked in, it all, I was there at the time, or there were graffiti all over the walls, certain parts of the building had been defaced. And this on a slogan, it was you who taught me that peace, peaceful protest is, is futile. I think this was, is really an important slogan because it was a kind of a breathtaking moment. After all, these uh, were protesters who five years ago, when it came to the umbrella movement, had really been known for the peacefulness of the movement for uh, the civility, everyone mentioned the politeness. This was a place uh, during the umbrella movement where people were in the streets for 79 days. They were known for you know, doing homework in a homework tent on site and doing the recycling. Um, and now five years on, some of the same group of protesters were directing this kind of violence against the symbols of the government. And you know, many people were asking, why is that? But I think it's precisely because of what happened during the umbrella movement, precisely because peaceful protests achieved nothing. So the umbrella movement had been because uh, protesters, Hong Kong people had wanted more democratic participation in choosing a chief executive. But in August, 2014, um, Beijing handed down a decision, which I'm sure the other panelists will speak about, which really stifled democratization and the whole democratic process. Um, so that was that launched a month later, the umbrella movement, 79 days of peaceful protest that won no concessions at all. So the lesson from the umbrella movement, I think, was quite clear. People believe peaceful protest didn't achieve anything. So for that, I'll go to my second slogan, which is winding back five years to the very last day of the umbrella movement. Um, 
And I was standing there at that time watching the clearance of this site. I think, again, it's so important. Law is really at the heart of this. It's so important that we have a panel of lawyers because uh, law has been used as a tool by the government all the way through. And the umbrella movement was ended not by force, but by legal means when transport operators filed these legal injunctions asking for the roads to be cleared and a judge found in their favor. And bailiffs came and cleared the roads. 955 people were arrested on that day. And I remember looking at that sign, it's just the beginning. And, you know, at the time, it seemed, it seemed quite unlikely because that day the mood on the site was so depressed, so demor demoralized. It didn't feel like the beginning. It felt like an end. But that, 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 since that moment, there were warnings all along. And I remember um, speaking to Chan Ken Man, and he actually said, to, who's one of the founders of the Umbrella Movement, one of the co-founders, and he said, he warned at that time, he said, what we're asking is very moderate in the sense that it's totally within the framework of the basic law. If these very moderate things cannot be satisfied, people will resort to more radical moves and actions. I mean, actually, to begin with, that didn't happen. In the immediate aftermath of the Umbrella Movement, we saw the Umbrella Generation really trying to work within the system. They started political parties, these localist movements like Joshua Wong's Demosisto, Andy Chan's Hong Kong National Party, Hong Kong Indigenous from Edward Leung. And now we look back of those three names that I've mentioned, two have served prison sentences, uh, and one is an exile. So working inside the system didn't go so well. I think that brings me to the third slogan, which has been really important and increasingly important over the years, uh, liberate Hong Kong revolution of our times. This first emerged uh, a couple of years later in 2016, when Edward Leung, who'd started this localist group, Hong Kong Indigenous, stood in a by-election and this was his slogan. It's a really ambiguous slogan. Uh, even the translation, it is, it's hard to translate. And that first couple of characters could be liberate, could be restore, could be reclaim. So it could be read as a sort of declaration of an independence or a call to restore Hong Kong identity. Uh, or a revolution could, you know, there's so many different readings of it. And I think that's why it's been such a, um, a a slogan that really speaks to so many people in different ways. But at the time when, in February 2016, I don't think that it was, back then Hong Kong indigenous was uh, still seen as a relatively fringe group. But Edward Leung, uh, he didn't win that election, but he did, I think he came third, he did, he did quite well. And seven months later, he tried to run in the election in September 2016, and he was banned from running. So he, along with other candidates, this new uh, kind of uh, regulation was brought in that candidates had to sign forms saying that Hong Kong was an inalienable part of China. And some of them, even though they signed these forms, they still got disqualified. Um, so after he was disqualified, another candidate, Badio Leung, who's standing in, in the middle of this picture from a group called Young Spiration, was chosen as the Plan B candidate. Uh, to replace him, and he got elected in, which brings me to my fourth slogan, Hong Kong is not China. So this is the moment in, uh, uh, after that election when Badio Leung took his oath of office, and then <laughs> it is also the moment that, uh, that really sealed his fate. Because of this act, he was then uh, subsequently kicked out of the legislature. So this act of oath taking in Hong Kong has often been used for sort of grandstanding and political statements. And when he was taking the oath, along with another young inspiration candidate, he wielded this flag saying Hong Kong is not China. And um, he, later, six other, he was one of six legislators who got kicked out because of this act. And this was called as Oathgate. Um, and the way in which that disqualification happened, uh, perhaps some of our other panelists will speak to it. But again, it was really important because the decision was, uh, there was a case going through the Hong Kong courts, but the ruling by the Hong Kong judge was actually um, preempted by a decision from Beijing, a retrospective interpretation of the basic law. So of the six candidates who were elected and then 
um, kicked out of the legislature. One of them was kicked out for saying the oath too slowly. Um, another, Nathan Law, said it in the wrong intonation and added a quote from Gandhi at the end. And at that time, it, uh, I think November, um, around that time, I interviewed Baggio Leung, and he said that before they took their oath, they studied uh, a, a previous case involving a uh, very famous lawmaker known as Longhair. And they took legal advice, and they believed that based on precedent, what they had done would be acceptable because they did not change the oath in any way. They were adding things before and after. But the court, uh, Beijing did not find in that favor, in their favor. And I would add that back then, this sentiment, Hong Kong is not China, um, was perhaps not that widespread. I would add that Baggio Leung was very heavily criticized for this action. People thought that he was very infantile. And when I interviewed him, I remember that he was very defensive about it and said, you, you shouldn't judge our behavior because of the results. And he also warned, he said, if we can solve problems in a peaceful way, no one would want to be radical, but people feel more and more hopeless. So they will try whatever means they can, including a radical way. So that brings me to the fifth slogan, no to China extradition. And this is from that March a, a year ago today when uh, the Hong Kong government tried to introduce the extradition legislation that sparked the massive protests because of fears that it would undermine one country, two systems. And so this movement, that started last year began against, as a specific movement against that legislation, but very quickly uh, there were new demands involving a, a, um, a investigation into police brutality, that people who had been taken, uh, detained should be uh, released, um, and, and also uh, added to that that this particular protest on June the 12th shouldn't be classed as a riot, and um, that this then widened into a demand for universal suffrage. And then, as we've seen, into a democracy movement and more. Um, in, in the year since, we have seen this sort of clear acts of police brutality and a spiral of violence as the protesters then retaliated with Molotov cocktails and um, all kinds of and so we've seen, as of June the 4th, the arrests of 8,938 people. Um, people have been arrested um, in, for all kinds of uh, different acts. Um, the, we've seen huge rollbacks of freedom, police banning gatherings, declaring protests illegal halfway through the protests, um, arresting organizers who actually had letters of permission, We've seen people arrested for simply wearing black or standing in the wrong place. Um, of those arrests, 593 people have been charged with rioting, um, which actually uh, carries a 10-year sentence. And um, one really interesting point is of those people who broke into the legislature, that um, there were four main protesters. Um, and their charge yesterday was increased to rioting. And one of them, Brian Learn, who took off his mask and showed his face and spoke um, in LegCo, yesterday he tweeted, if riot is the language of the unheard, the riot law is a language of a government that refuses to hear its people. So we're seeing the language of the law being used, but we're also seeing the language of violence. In the past year, 80% of the population have been tear gassed. A third of the population have PTSD. Everybody spends their nights watching live streams of people being arrested and beaten. Uh, people have been shot. Um, and in the past year, many of the things that mark Hong Kong out from China have really come under assault. The legislative assembly has been sidelined. The police and the civil service um, are not seen as neutral anymore. And the judiciary, the independent judiciary is being massively eroded. Uh, but despite the criminalization of um, large scale assemblies, police uh, people are still gathering and we saw that yesterday in Central. But I think all of those are reasons why Beijing ha has se seen the need to take this very drastic set step to implement national security legislation and do it through the National People's Congress Standing Committee in Beijing. Um, the reaction on the ground has been 
uh, in large part among people in the movement has been shock, horror, panic and fear. And there's been this sort of huge spike in migration inquiries as well. Um, and massive implications for press freedom. On our podcast, we interviewed Jimmy Lai, who runs Apple Daily, and he said, anything we write, anything we say could be a crime. Um, but I guess this leads me to the sixth slogan. And we've seen this big propaganda campaign over the, since this uh, decision has been announced. And there's been a lot of pictures like this circulating um, in the last few weeks. The, this particular picture is Hong Kong delegates to the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. Um, and there, you know, it doesn't really matter what the banners say, all the banners are saying these very various uh, statements supporting the national security uh, legislation. And we've seen this sort of full court press propaganda campaign with civil servants and religious leaders and politicians lining up to support this legislation. It's, um, to me, it's very reminiscent almost of the, these kind of loyalty pledges that we see in communist culture. Um, when, um, in fact, in our podcast, when Jimmy Lai was, I asked him why he thought people were doing, why, why, why were we seeing these scenes? And he said, there is no space for silence anymore. Um, the government requires people to show their support, which to me was so reminiscent of the, the way in which Deng Xiaoping uh, required military generals to give these oaths of support before the Tiananmen uh, crackdown in 1989. Uh, anyway, that brings me to my final picture and my final slogan. And this is from June the 4th, last weekend, Hong Kong independence, the only way out. This is not a chant that we had heard until about a month ago. And now it's surprising how, how much it's heard. Um, and not just among small groups, uh, even actually at the June the 4th vigil in, here in Melbourne, Hong Kongers were, were shouting this slogan. And I think it shows how radicalized protesters have become. Um, of course, to Beijing, this justifies the need for this legislation. And I think, you know, there were so many questions, which I hope th the panel <laughs> after me is going, is going to address. But even at the moment, you know, I've been to the courts and seen some of these major cases and the courts are so entirely overburdened, you know, there are even these procedural questions. How can they possibly uh, try cases when they're already totally overburdened? Um, you know, who are the people who will try these cases? How will these crimes be defined? Uh, but it's at this point, it's very hard to see any off ramps to an end, which I think this time last year, nobody could have foreseen. Um, and I'll end there. Thank you so much, Louisa. Um, our next speaker is Martin Flaherty. Uh, Martin, please go ahead. And remember, um, those of you listening, feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box. Great. Thank you. Am I duly unmuted this time? Good. Thank you, Twyla. And thank you, Louisa. That was great. Um, so uh, my remit here um, is to discuss how international standards, and in particular international human rights law, uh, has born upon Hong Kong and continues to bear upon Hong Kong. So uh, let me start with just some preliminaries, some basics for those of you who are not uh, lawyers. And even if you are, uh, American lawyers tend to be undereducated with regard to international law. So uh, two preliminary basic points. One is the sources of relevant uh, international law um, that would bear upon Hong Kong. And there are three, I would argue. One is, and the most important would be um, international agreements, uh, colloquially known as treaties. Those are generally self-explanatory. Another less familiar, particularly to uh, a US audience, is customary international law, which very loosely defined is our standards that are binding on every nation in the world, um, uh, so long as basically a whole lot of countries for a significant amount of time either do something or don't do something. 
And then finally, one that is underutilized, but I think will be very important in the months and years going forward uh, for Hong Kong is what is known as soft law. The, these are international standards that don't purport to be binding, but look like law, act like law, and can be used by advocates as law. The most um, famous uh, example of that is the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. So that is the first point. The second preliminary point is when talking and thinking about international law, um, it's a two-level chess game. So uh, to the extent China and Hong Kong are bound by international standards, think uh, first that works on the international plane and whatever international mechanisms exist or don't exist would work there. But then what's also critically important is the extent to which international standards come into domestic law, in particular into Hong Kong domestic law and to the extent that the courts can enforce those international standards. So let me run through um, uh, the basic standards that principally uh, are useful in um, thinking about Hong Kong, particularly um, with regard to democratization and the introduction of the uh, uh, proposed national security law. So first, uh, and perhaps foremost, or at least uh, first uh, in time uh, that would be relevant, uh, is the Sino-British Joint Declaration of uh, 1984. That, notwithstanding uh, uh, Beijing's attempts to um, demote it as a mere policy statement, in international law, that is considered a binding international treaty between the United Kingdom and China. And um, China and the United Kingdom are obligated to live up to the pledges made in that under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And that is what set the first pattern of one country, two systems that guaranteed that Hong Kong would have both its uh, traditional economic system and its legal system, including the protection of fundamental rights, as well as a pledge to democratize uh, more or less in the short order LegCo and in the longer term, although it's more ambiguous in the joint declaration, uh, the election of the chief executive. Um, next, and what will be critically important with regard to the operation of the national security law is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The United Kingdom acceded to this important human rights treaty when Hong Kong was still a colony. And by the terms of the handover, it was still to apply to Hong Kong as it did previously when Hong Kong was under British control. The ICCPR is essentially the Bill of Rights. It's a global Bill of Rights with the familiar, what are known as negative rights that reflect rights, say, in the US Bill of Rights. Particularly relevant with regard to Hong Kong, and one thing that tends to get lost in light of the introduction of the national security law, is that Article 25, in particular 25B of the ICCPR, guarantees some form of democratic accountability. Now, there are a lot of ambiguities there. There are a lot of complications there with regard to its application to Hong Kong. But there is a non-trivial argument that the ICCPR uh, would mandate, ultimately, um, uh, some form of universal suffrage for both uh, LegCo and the uh, selection of the chief executive. But what's uh, going to be of more immediate importance because of the national security law that's been introduced in light of the events that Louisa recounted is going to be the basic guarantees of fundamental rights and freedoms in the ICCPR. Articles 19, 20, and 21 guarantee free expression, free association, um, uh, and related rights. 9 and 10 guarantee essential due process rights with regard to detention uh, and trials. Um, and uh, all of these come into Hong Kong law through Article 39 of the Basic Law. So the basic law of uh, Hong Kong, which is essentially a statute of the National People's Congress, um, that was China um, sort of living up to its pledges under the uh, Sino-British Joint Declaration. But with regard to the ICCPR, what um, the uh, basic law does is incorporate the protections 
of the ICCPR into Hong Kong domestic law. So the ICCPR is going to work on both of the chess levels, both on the international plane and on the domestic plane. And then finally, one uh, other international treaty worth mentioning in light of some of the heavy handed police tactics uh, is the Convention Against Torture and Inhumane and Degrading Treatment, which China is, uh, uh, has acceded to. And there in Articles 1, 2, and 16, it essentially says no torture at any point for any reason under any circumstances, nor what is uh, not defined but still stipulated, nor uh, inhuman and degrading treatment. So those are some of the treaty laws that uh, bear upon Hong Kong. Uh, arguably, everything I've just discussed, with the possible exception of democratization, is also enshrined in customary international law. Um, and there, there's a strong additional uh, principle in customary international law with regard to rights, which is there is no backsliding. There is no retrogression is the technical legal term. So to the extent that there is backsliding with regard to these rights, um, customary international law could kick in then. And then finally, with regard to soft law, there are some UN principles, which are essentially um, resolutions by the General Assembly, which by definition are not binding, but again, have the kind of operation of law in effect. And I've actually used these in other places in the world, particularly Northern Ireland, uh, where similar problems arose back in the day. And with regard to pressure on the Hong Kong judiciary and Hong Kong lawyers, which is going to be significant in the upcoming uh, months, there are uh, the UN basic principles on the independence of the judiciary, which says just that the judiciary is supposed to be independent and apply the law in a neutral, impartial way. And the UN basic principles on lawyers. Um, which guarantee that lawyers are supposed to be able to practice their profession and practice legal defense without retaliation from the state. So uh, um, basically, all of that's well and good. The question is, what about enforcement, which is always the problem with international law? And here, I think Nico and Sharon are going to say more about this, but just to set things up for them very generally, uh, with regard to domestic enforcement, the key player is going to be the judiciary and with the judiciary, uh, the ability of lawyers to um, uh, uh, bring uh, human rights and civil rights challenges. With regard to the judiciary, because as I said, Article 39 of the Basic Law brings down the ICCPR, Ordinarily, what happens is if LegCo or the Hong Kong government does something, that's subject to these international rights. And indeed, the Court of Final Appeals of Hong Kong has applied the ICCPR and ICCPR rights, sometimes upholding them, more often denying them, I'd have to say, um, with regard to uh, ordinances from LegCo. The problem here, which Nico, I believe, is going to talk about in more detail, is the nationals, proposed national security law from Beijing creates all sorts of problems with that model and opens all sorts of unresolved questions about whether the Hong Kong courts are going to be able to review that national legislation against the ICCPR. And however you slice it, there, uh, Beijing also has a trump card, which it's played before and which Louisa mentioned, which is that when um, the National People's Congress Standing Committee either doesn't like or thinks it won't like an interpretation protecting rights from the Hong Kong courts, under Article 158 of the Basic Law, it can interpret the Basic Law in a way that is inconsistent with what the court said. It would be as if the US Congress overrules what a state Supreme Court says about basic rights. And then one final worry to look at is um, uh, the, um, uh, there have been uh, intimations that there might be created a special security court for Hong Kong, which might take 
all of this outside of the ordinary judiciary, which would set a, a terribly bad precedent that has been a disaster in other jurisdictions. Very quickly, with regard to lawyers, lawyers have already been under great pressure and intimidation, both by the government and on the internet. Human Rights First has just come out with a report in which lawyers in Hong Kong are saying they feel widespread intimidation for taking on unpopular cases. And their fears are double given uh, the fate of lawyers on the mainland, which has been dire. Um, we are coming up on the sixth anniversary of what's known as the 709 crackdown, where hundreds of lawyers were disappeared, um, disbarred, uh, and even tortured. And then my final point would be, well, what about foreign implementation? And uh, the problem is there are really going to be no options or very few options or problematic options for international courts to adjudicate any of this, um, not least because Beijing won't allow itself to be dragged before the ICJ or any uh, international tribunal. That said, there are international options, which I think Sharon will talk about. There are special rapporteurs um, uh, that the UN has. There is also uh, a movement in, in the UN and among those who are uh, trying to challenge the global uh, extension of counterterrorism laws in a way that undermine human rights um, uh, and try to get UN mechanisms to push back against that. Another uh, uh, way to enforce and implement international law is through governments. Um, the UK actually so far has been surprisingly good in the last few weeks as, a, uh, as opposed to being traditionally surprisingly bad in the last 15 years or so. And I'll leave it to Sharon to talk about that if she would or leave that for the Q&A. The US has been paradoxical. It's been very firm, but I just wrote an article saying how effective is are US condemnations of heavy-handed security crackdowns in Hong Kong when you have uh, President Trump and Pompeo walking across Lafayette Park doing just that um, in the United States. Um, and finally, um, that leaves what perhaps is a lot of people in the audience, international civil society, bar associations like the New York City Bar, the International Bar Association, and NGOs like Human Rights in China, Human Rights First, and Human Rights Watch to really keep the pressure on in the application of these international standards um, to these developments in Hong Kong. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, Sharon, I believe you're next. Thank you. See I was you. trying to unmute there and I thought go. there was some intervention from some further north forces letting me unmute myself. So thank you so much. And um, um, uh, Thank you, Twyla, for uh, asking us to share the uh, 1997 moment for all of us. Uh, I do want to just say that that moment might have been short, but as you say, I think it was actually a long now moment. There was a long now leading up to that moment, and that moment is playing out for up to the very present and ongoing. Um, thank you, Louisa, for laying out the milestones in this very interesting, creative way uh, via the slogans, and I think it actually um, gives us all the touchstones at a very high level of some of the different uh, uh, developments of the trajectory of the moment. I think what it actually shows and what I want to start by underscoring is that actually since 1997, there has been a steady encroachment on all of the uh, promises and obligations which have been intensifying in the last maybe half year and really seriously intensifying. Um, and that really infringes on fundamental rights and freedoms. So what I think, uh, the way I would frame um, the, I, I will be picking up on what Martin laid out very cogently and clearly about the international system and framework, is I'll just deep dive a little bit and add another layer of granularity to the way in which that international framework and standards play out in Hong Kong. And then I might try to just uh, apply some of that uh, to the decision, but I'm gonna really leave it to Nico to do the really legal technical exegesis of the national security decision. So um, one way I think that 
I would characterize this moment now is that it's actually a very intense showdown between Hong Kong people who are absolutely despite what um, I agree with uh, 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 Louisa, that there's a certain amount of fear, um, uh, depression, hopelessness, desperation, but at the same time, I think there's a very clear resistance and persistence uh, and creatively in Hong Kong people asserting their rights and freedoms that they are very clear were guaranteed to them under international law and also under the basic law of Hong Kong. And so the showdown is between Hong Kong people and I think the central government in Beijing loyally carrying out uh, its instructions by the SAR, the Special Administrative Region, or I'll just call it the SAR administration. So um, recently uh, in Victoria Park, as everyone knows was widely reported, there was a ban on, for the first time in 31 years, a ban on the gathering, which has in the past attracted over 100,000 people. So that Hong Kong was the only place in China that had uh, 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 that space for people to publicly remember uh, the crackdown in 1989 by the military and also to stand in solidarity with the mainland groups like the Tiananmen Mothers who year after year are uh, trying to still push for accountability and the end of impunity for that military crackdown. So Hong Kong is the only place that was allowed to do that. And everyone said they're not going to get permission to do it. And there was a lot of speculation as what would happen this year. And then what actually happened this year were thousands of Hong Kong people streamed into the park and lit a candle or uh, lit their, not lit, but turned on the lights of their cell phone. And one of the journalists um, from the stand described that moment as saying, we should be cautious to make any conclusions about Hong Kong people giving up or not giving up, because what is really actually happening is a much more flexible, dynamic, complex mobilization. And that moment, June 4th, actually exemplifies it. And that instead of just streaming into the park as we normally do on June 4th, there was a lot of milling around, uh, around Haesan Place. There was a lot of milling around in uh, Tong Lao Wan, uh, Causeway Bay. And people were monitoring on their cell phones when it might be safe to go in, where the movements of the police were. And at the end of the day, they all went in. And I think that moment was described very, very accurately as uh, this is shows that man hei but gum, that is the people's spirit never diminished. So that's the moment of this showdown. And then I'll, I'll put that into a, a little bit of a context is that, um, in addition to the way that the trajectory and the milestones that Louisa laid out, I think it's also useful to think of it in the way that was just recently described and summarized by uh, Professor C.K. Lee, uh, who is of UCLA and, and, and now in Hong Kong. And she says that this moment actually shows two things. One is, let's be careful about defining failure, that every single failure in the movement has led to a lesson, a learning, and, a, and, and they called it failing forward. I think that's very important. The second thing as, uh, that she's cogently described is that what we're now seeing is a proliferation of frontline sat strategies and that there's a broader sense of ownership over these strategies and that these strategies are cross-generation and cross-social sectors and that it's creating Hong Kong itself as a collective political actor that is expanding beyond the street actions to include institution building. And that we saw that already last year in the district council elections, where the local grassroots community shocked Beijing and the world. And they won. And the landslide was 17 out of the 18 district were completely won by the pandemics. Secondly, um, the other institution that's building is an alternative vision of what an economic, a fair, just, a local ownership kind of economic model would look like, and that's the yellow circle. And thirdly, there is a mass unionization movement happening with almost more than 20 new unions. And right now there's a vote mobilizing around whether there should be a broad uh, strike in Hong Kong. So these are all peaceful movements. And just last night, or our morning, their night, uh, was launched a whole camp uh, 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 initiative, uh, which is going to uh, begin a public voting and really launching in every single district 
for the pandems to get a sense of preparing for the 35 plus LegCo uh, seats uh, that they're hoping to recapture or capture in, uh, in the fall. And the organizers of the pandems made this statement last night and said, we know, we're not stupid, they said, we know there will be efforts to disqualify the DQ of candidates. We know they will attack candidates. We know there will be election interference. But for Hong Kongers, we must continue to exercise our rights until it's really not possible, but it's still possible. And until that moment is possible, show up at the voting. Uh, they're setting up voting stations throughout all of Hong Kong, on the island, in Kowloon, and in the new territories. So I think that is a very important uh, grassroots image to keep in mind when we think about this national security implementation and what the threats are. So what, um, why does Hong Kong matter beyond the impact on the seven poor million people, 7.4 million people. And I think that um, building on what Martin said, I think that what is at stake now is the compliance by the central government, a powerful political and economic actor in the world, China, and the SAR government. So what is at stake is their compliance with their international obligations. And in particular, what I want to focus on is their compliance with international human rights. And so, um, the, the, the higher level point I want to pick up on is that, yes, law is being used to legalize the criminalization of the peaceful exercise of rights. And, and that has also been remarked on by the UN special experts. Um, but why, why do we have to hold China accountable? Because China, since it took over the Republic of China seat, Taiwan seat at the UN, has been an active member of the UN it has assumed key leadership positions, advancing alternative normative models to the UN, uh, existing international system, the system that was set up post-World War II to ensure that what happened under the Nazi regime and other fascist regimes, the murder of millions of people would never happen again, genocide. So this is the existing system. And what China is doing, being a very active member of that system, is offering alternative models for human rights, development, democracy, and rule of law. All of those with a tagline with Chinese characteristics. So China is an active player in that system. And secondly, China has signed and ratified all the major human rights treaties that is the second level that Martin mentioned, and including on economic, social, cultural rights, eliminating torture, eliminating discrimination, racial discrimination, eliminating discrimination against women, protecting the rights of the child and rights of persons with disabilities and so forth. On the ICCPR, because uh, under, while it was under colonial rule, China is, uh, uh, I mean, Hong, uh, the SAR is bound by the ICCPR. Under the arrangement of the handover, the ICCPR continued to be in force in Hong Kong and then embedded in the Hong Kong Bill of Rights Ordinance and also embedded in the um, basic law. However, one note that I want to emphasize is that China, that is central government China, um, signed the ICCPR, has not yet ratified it despite over a decade of them being pushed by the international community and international human rights mechanisms, has consistently reassured the world, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. And, but under the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties, and I'll defer to the international law experts here, Martin, and to Nico, uh, I'm not an international private law person, but under the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties, once you've signed the treaty, what, even if you haven't ratified it, you are obligated not to take any action that violates the spirit and substance of the covenant, meaning that they are bound in, 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 uh, to, to, to uh, uh, those obligations. Um, so on the Sino-British um, Joint Declaration, that is the key treaty that we care about today in our discussion. And uh, it has been laid out by the others that, you know, that Hong Kong is supposed to enjoy a high degree of autonomy. We're supposed to have our way of life unchanged for 50 years. And while the one country, two system concept principle was not mentioned in the joint declaration, it was very clearly part of the negotiations because China or Deng Xiaoping actually brought it up. And, and Martin Lee, who tells the story that he was on the negotiation committee, he, they all said, what? 
what is one country, two system? And they thought, oh, okay, you know, and that under that system, they would be guaranteed this autonomy. And it was China that we need to remember in light of its current accusations of interference with internal affairs of Hong Kong. It was China who internationalized Hong Kong that on the negotiations to the handover, it was China who sought the support of the international community, specifically the G7 states, and wanted their blessing to say, this is good, they're gonna hand it back to us, we're gonna... So the G7 states and the US, who played a key role in brokering the whole deal. So they were, we have to remember that th what was in China's national interest at that time was to show to Taiwan watching from across the straits that we have a model that could work first in Hong Kong and then you will come back to the motherland under this model. So we know how that worked out because I think President Tsai Ing-wen has very clearly said when she was elected and just last week, no, not gonna work for us. So that, that's the uh, main international uh, treaty. And um, so what I'm gonna do is go on to the decision and I'll, I'll leave it definitely Nico for you to go into the weeds, but what I wanna say about the, the decision is this. Yes, it has generated a lot of concern, but it has also fueled, again, refueled local resistance and public mobilization because the, the serious concerns that were raised about exporting a mainland security approach into Hong Kong for a people who has very clearly remembering the abduction of the Hong Kong booksellers the torture of the Hong Kong booksellers and, um, and a staffer of the UK mission in Hong Kong, who then subsequently also uh, uh, um, um, uh, exposed that he was also tortured, is going to be what people have in mind when, when journalists ask Carrie Lam, what's going to happen under the national security law? Will we have to be tried on the mainland? Can we be taken abroad? You know, will mainland security forces be here? Actually, yes. You know, and, and Carrie Lam said, those are details. Don't worry about it. The rights and freedoms will be protected. So the NPC decision, while we're pending the promulgation of the actual law, has generated a lot of uh, uh, discussion. And local constitutional experts and international experts have, helped, have all pointed out that, that the decision itself to authorize the NPC Standing Committee to draft the legislation violates the Chinese constitution, violates the basic law, and also seriously undermines one country, two system. But the important thing about the decision is it has been a very belated wake up call for the international community. We know that there's been a series of very serious human rights abuses, including the incarceration of millions of ethnic Uyghurs in camps, and including in the repression of Tibetan religious uh, freedom and cultural freedom. Well, this has been going on, and the lawyers being disappeared, the, you know, July 15th. None of this really generated, made a difference. June 4th did not really make a difference for China. So yet this made a wake up call where the UK, as Martin said, you know, previously wasn't gonna have a lot of uh, political courage here. And I have to say, it's really quite uh, uh, encouraging, uh, cautiously encouraging, that it has now threatened Beijing, don't do it, don't pass it, do not cross the Rubicon. Because if you cross that step, it will be a bridge too far for the Western democracies, and we will absolutely respond with giving the DNO holders a path to citizenship. And the US has already also jumped in and said, if you do this, we will also in, you know, uh, uh, really uh, already made the declaration that Hong Kong's no longer uh, autonomous and qualify for independent custom status, et cetera, et cetera. So the international community is actually waking up. So let me close by um, saying uh, a couple of insights. And I don't, Nico, just signal me if you're going to do this, so I'll stop. Like, just go, you know. But I want to say something about the, the threats that the decision purports to, to address. And this is important because the, the, the threats seem like, well, it sounds reasonable, you know. So the decision says what we're really concerned about are violent terrorist activities, demands for independence, separatism, and foreign and overseas forces that are interfering in Hong Kong affairs. So I want to just say something quickly about what do they really mean by that? What could they really mean by that? And actually, we know what they mean by that, even without the legislative history. So first of all, what they mean by um, foreign interference is that when the UK government, 
a co-signatory of the joint declaration, the Sino-British Declaration, raised concern in the past about um, the uh, one country, two system principle being, being uh, 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 undermined. And in mid-August, when we were all concerned about the es es escalation of the local movement, the UK government called for calm from all sides. That's a pretty good thing to call for. However, the Chinese ambassador to the UK said, you should refrain from saying or doing anything that interferes or undermines the rule of law. Calling for calm is an interference. On November 18, 2019, when the UK Foreign Office said it was seriously concerned that injured demonstrators receive appropriate medical care, the response by Chinese ambassador was, do not interfere. So we need to be very cautious that these are considered interference. When the UN human rights experts, these are appointed independent experts by the UN with a mandate set by the UN, has jointly issued statements of concerns about the police violence, about the impact on the exercise of rights, about the criminalization of peaceful assembly, on the, um, the arrests of the uh, 15 uh, Democrats, the Chinese government has also responded by saying, you are interfering with our um, uh, uh, internal affairs. And finally, on the sedition and counterterrorism, um, the special rapporteur on counterterrorism, on extrajudicial execution, on freedom of expression, freedom of association, human rights defenders, and on minority issues, issued in April and then followed by a, a strong statement in May, just in mid-May, they express strong concern that the existing laws in Hong Kong, the anti-terrorism law, the sedition law that's already existing, they express strong concerns that the local law was not compatible with international human rights standards. And they said, we reiterate our concern about the use of anti-terrorism law to regulate legitimate protest. And that they emphasized there needs to be a careful definition of what constitutes terrorism. And they also expressed their concern about criminalizing peaceful expression. Um, on violence, that'll be where I'll end is on violence, um, is uh, in addition to what, um, I think the violence narrative of what the protest is about, we should be very cautious because that exactly is the narrative of Beijing, that it's all about violence, when in fact, a vast majority of the proliferation of the strategies are peaceful. The arrests since, as of the um, end of May, out of a prison population in Hong Kong, a total prison population of 7,737, that is out of the whole prison population in 2019, the protesters arrested were 18% of the prison population. Yeah, 18%. On what charges? Were they all for terrorist activities, throwing petrol bombs? No. They were for allegations of charges of unlawful assembly, vandalism, disclosing personal data, refusing to obey police orders, uh, first aid responders not carrying the appropriate licenses, uh, Democistos members importing masks that were not made in China, uh, so, so forth, so forth, plus some in possession of offensive weapons, arson and assault. Those charges are all, all covered under existing law, under the public order in ordinance. In other words, all of these activities that have raised so much concern about the destruction of law and order, collapse of law and order in Hong Kong, are currently covered and being prosecuted by the legal system under Hong Kong law. So I point that out to say that the crisis of law and order and the crisis of the seeds of terrorism lurking and the crisis of foreign interference in Hong Kong that has been invoked uh, by the central government, echoed by the SAR government, is we need to be very cautious about looking at the facts and about what's really behind those allegations because some of that narrative is really based on an alternative factual universe that is basically a kind of a fact adverse universe. And so hopefully we can explore some of that in the um, discussion after Nico takes us through a very technical exegesis of the law itself. Thank you.
Wonderful, Sharon, for that very dynamic talk. Thank you. Uh, Nico, on to you. So I've been advertised as about to present something very technical and I ex expect um, our viewership or our participants to go way down. So I'll try and be as dynamic uh, as uh, Sharon and the other speakers. And I should just say it's a real honor uh, to follow uh, the other panelists, all of whom are longtime friends, uh, not only because they're expert observers of what's happened in Hong Kong and other parts of the world, uh, but they're also, they have a color of uh, activism. So they've used their careful observation, their understanding of the law and politics to follow um, developments in Hong Kong, uh, specifically in a very, um, I think, uh, ultimately a very responsible way. So it's, it's great for me to be on. Um, what I want to do in my remarks, and hopefully I can keep it uh, kind of short, is to focus on uh, what makes the decision of May 28, 2020, so such a departure from uh, the Hong Kong system uh, that we have come to know and love since the handover in 1997. And it's this, if you look at uh, uh, Article 6 or Paragraph 6 of the, uh, the NPC, the National People's Congress, decision, you see that um, what's on offer are, think of two streams of light. Uh, one stream of light is uh, that the Hong Kong legislature, i.e. the Hong Kong LegCo, will pass or reenact its own ordinances, that's what we call uh, Hong Kong LegCo lawmaking, on national security matters. But in addition, uh, the NPC Standing Committee itself as the PRC legislator will also directly legislate national security norms for Hong Kong or applicable um, to Hong Kong. Now this, uh, as I hope to make a, a good case, is a radical departure from what the invitation is in Article 23 of the Basic Law itself, which says that um, this kind of security legislation for Hong Kong should be done by what? By the Hong Kong legislature and not by any other legislator. Uh, and it should be done uh, by the Hong Kong, uh, 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 the Hong Kong legislature uh, on its own. Uh, and uh, it's a real departure in that you have something which apparently applies to Hong Kong's internal affairs being included on Annex 3 of the Basic Law, which is supposed to be a place, a bucket, where you reserve norms, um, uh, national norms that do not impinge upon the autonomous purview uh, of Hong Kong. So uh, Sharon and I think Martin raised some of the, um, some of the disputes that are currently um, uh, 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 common about uh, what happened in the decision. I'm not gonna talk about those things today in my hopefully uh, short uh, remarks. Uh, a couple of those uh, uh, figure like this. Well, is the decision contrary to Article 23 itself in the basic law? Because for crying out loud, Article 23 says, that this kind of legislation should be done by the Hong Kong SAR itself, uh, right? And when you have the NPC legislature either commanding the Hong Kong legislature to do legislation or legislating itself directly, that seems to be in, uh, in distinction. Now there's an answer to that and it's common out there, which is, well, it doesn't say exclusively, and it was merely an invitation for Hong Kong to you know, get the security legislation uh, up to speed uh, long after the handover and excise all those references to the queen or the king or the, or the British uh, sovereign. By the same token, there's a very good argument out there that, uh, in fact, by including the uh, forthcoming legislation on uh, Annex 3 of the Basic Law, that's also contrary to the spirit of the Basic Law. Why? Because Annex 3 is supposed to um, uh, list national laws with application in Hong Kong uh, but that relate only to what? National defense and foreign affairs or, ready, otherwise don't impact upon the, autonomous, the autonomy of Hong Kong. It's a real stretch, at least in my mind, to see how this national security legislation has anything to do with foreign affairs or national defense. And it's kind of a contradiction to say that it doesn't relate to uh, the autonomy of Hong Kong when it's all about internal uh, security. But those are fights that I don't want to fight today in my remarks. Instead, what I really want to focus on, as I've said, is this new phenomenon whereby the NPC Standing Committee, the Central People's Government, has declared its decision to go forward with direct legislation, at least in part, which impacts upon national security matters in Hong Kong. Now, if you read the decision carefully uh, and in a fairly benign manner, 
you will discover that uh, the, the, the central people's government is not grabbing to itself the ability to legislate entirely on all national security uh, measures. The way I read the decision in conjunction with what Article 23 itself says about um, uh, what this legislation should comprise, it looks to me like the NPC legislation um, uh, will solely, um, uh, without uh, accompanying Hong Kong ordinances, solely address uh, separatism, subversion, terrorism, and all other kinds of overseas interference in Hong Kong affairs other than what is listed in Article 23, which is Hong Kong political groups, establishment of ties with foreign political groups. While the standbys of treason, sedition, theft of state secrets, and Hong Kong political groups establishing ties with foreign political groups will be left, it looks like, to the uh, Hong Kong ordinances that exist already. They will just be amended uh, in whatever way the NPC Standing Committee um, uh, commands. Now, why does all this matter? Well, uh, let's, do a, let's do a Martin Flaherty prim a primer on rights protection by judiciaries across the world, and in particular under um, uh, the US and later the EU model and now even the Canadian model. There's an idea that rights are protected in any society, via the courts at least, by judicial institutions declaring that either a legal norm facially or a legal norm as uh, implemented uh, or by government action is invalid. Why? Because it conflicts with some superior norm. Now in the US, we're used to that superior norm being the constitution. It doesn't have to be the constitution. It could be a treaty. Uh, it could be a human rights bill. It could be a human rights uh, ordinance. It could be something which is deemed to be superior. Now that is exactly the model that Hong Kong largely adopted at the handover. Why do I say they largely adopted that? Well, as all of the uh, other panelists know so well, and I'm sure that many of our listeners understand, after 1997, via the basic law, was established a mechanism whereby the Hong Kong Court of Appeal could look to the basic law itself and the rights guarantees embedded inside uh, the basic law plus the cross-reference via Article 39 out to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal could look at that and look at those uh, provisions and say, ah, here's a Hong Kong legislative ordinance which does not comport with those rights guarantees, or here is a Hong Kong action, a Hong Kong government action that do does not comport with those uh, guarantees. Now, there are exceptions. I think Martin invoked Article 158. The exceptions are where, again, this will be familiar to you by now, where the action uh, implicates either uh, 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 foreign affairs or uh, the national defense, in which case the final court of appeal, the court of final appeal in Hong Kong is obligated to make a reference up to what? The lawgiver, the lawmaker in Beijing, the NPC Standing Committee for an interpretation of the basic law, which is another way of saying the NPC Standing Committee gets to say, oh yeah, that Hong Kong action or that Hong Kong norm is or is not in conformity with the rights guarantees in the basic law. Now, I agree with Martin that that has worked. Uh, I probably am uh, even more, uh, I think it's worked better than many of people could expect. I call to mind immediately after the uh, handover, of course, the right of abode cases, but also uh, cases in which a uh, Hong Kong uh, wiretapping ordinance uh, was ruled, was invalidated uh, on explicitly constitutional grounds. Same thing for an indictment against Falun Gong demonstrators who, <laughs> where are you going to demonstrate in Hong Kong if you really want to make people mad and you're Falun Gong, go to the Xinhua office. And they did. And that indictment was uh, quashed uh, because it was not consistent with the uh, rights of free assembly uh, uh, under the Hong Kong basic law. So as I say, this system at least has worked uh, 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 fairly well uh, after 1997, but at least it's the system, it's the norms that we were uh, given. Um, now, what's important is that you have to understand that the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal has the ability to do that magic trick, but only with respect to what the action of the Hong Kong government or Hong Kong legislation, i.e. what LegCo spits out as ordinances, or the administrative regulation, uh, the administrative norms that are also uh, spat out by the Hong Kong uh, government. Now, contra that model is the model that we live with in the People's Republic of China. In the People's Republic of China, there is no institution like the Court of Final Appeals. There is no court that has the ability to resolve conflicts 
between any law, okay? And that's something which you've got to understand, other than the NPC Standing Committee itself. So in China, the NPC Standing Committee, i.e. the legislator, is tasked with saying, oh, we've got a number of laws out there and there seems to be a conflict and the laws there, we include the constitution and we are the ones as the legislator, as the fount of the uh, constitution and the laws who get to identify and remedy um, um, uh, uh, conflict. Now there is a mechanism in China for the NPC standing committee, again, the legislature to identify conflicts between subordinate norms and the laws or the constitution but not importantly laws like the basic law uh, and uh, the constitution of the PRC or other laws of the uh, PRC. So the important thing for you to understand is while there is admittedly no constitutional review uh, in China, much less anything like constitutional review, uh, there is no review of anything other than subordinate administrative norms as opposed to uh, laws from the PRC. And this is really important for you to understand. Why? Because what really matters in this situation is that the national security legislation, at least in part that is forthcoming, will be PRC statute that is promulgated directly by the PRC with application to Hong Kong. Now I'm positing that that legislation won't be expressed in local Hong Kong ordinance. If it is, then some of my critique may be diluted, but at this point, it doesn't appear that that's gonna be the case. So let me give you an example as to how this would matter or why this matters. And hopefully Martin and, uh, will correct me if my analysis is wrong. Posit a Hong Kong citizen who is charged with uh, subversion, but under the Hong Kong ordinance, Hong Kong legislation for subversion. When the state prosecutor brings a criminal charge, one of the immediate defenses any responsible lawyer would bring in reaction to say, is to say that that Hong Kong ordinance is in conflict with the basic rights guarantees that are set forth in the uh, basic law. And they can do that either in an abstract way, say, oh, your, your subversion ordinance isn't consistent with our rights guarantees or the action itself or the indictment itself. Now that is something which is perfectly placed before the courts of Hong Kong and the Court of Final Appeals, which is entitled, authorized, has a delegated power to do what? To say, you're right. That indictment and subversion under Hong Kong law is not consistent with the rights guarantees uh, granted under uh, uh, the basic law. Therefore, we quash the indictment or we even declare that part of the ordinance um, uh, not unconstitutional, but unbasic lawical. That's my own uh, uh, term of art. Now change the hypothetical. What if the same Hong Kong citizen is charged with, again, subversion, but not under the Hong Kong ordinance, instead under the PRC law on national security for the Hong Kong SAR. Once again, you would have a state prosecutor bringing a criminal charge, but here there's no, at least in my mind, defense um, uh, that the PRC law on national security, either facially or the executive action, which is the criminal indictment, is inconsistent with the Hong Kong basic law. Why? Because the Court of Final Appeal has no authority to uh, divine and remedy conflicts between two laws of equal status. And that's exactly what the national security law will be and the basic law. That, as I've detailed above, is solely the province of what? The NPC um, Standing Committee. Now, if the courts of Hong Kong, as we anticipate they might, because we know these are human judges who might be willing to push the envelope, say, throw a bird and say, look, um, to Beijing and say, um, you know, uh, we have the uh, uh, ability to do this and we declare that this uh, this indictment, this criminal charge is inconsistent with the basic law. Um, they are uh, uh, obligated to, uh, uh, to send that up to, uh, to the NPC Standing Committee uh, uh, before they make that ruling. And even if they don't, the NPC Standing Committee just sends down an interpretation of the basic law as Sharon referred to and as Martin referred to, which they have done quite often and increasingly often, just to say, nope, this indictment, uh, this criminal charge, or this law is actually consistent with uh, the basic law because that is what they have the sole uh, province uh, to do. So what I'm trying to indicate to you is why this is so important that what's coming is direct legislation from the NPC Standing Committee. There have been tremendous fights 
and there is continuing discourse on what the other panelists referred to as the promise of democratization, okay? Um, there's probably a really good debate as to what, the, uh, what China promised in terms of democratization of both the LegCo and the chief executive. At the same time, there's probably good debate on what uh, China and the world meant by two systems. Was it merely two economic systems or was it two systems whereby the system that was to be preserved included not only capitalism, but rule of law, maybe even a little hint of uh, democracy. I'm not going to address those, but I am going to address this important word autonomy, because I think it's what figures so strongly in the analysis that I've given. Um, there is no doubt that upon the handover, Hong Kong was promised, or we were promised, we, the world and the people of Hong Kong were promised uh, autonomy. Now, we all have different definitions of autonomy. My definition of autonomy is a little bit like sovereignty, but it's kind of a micro vision of autonomy but it certainly includes the ability of people within their own sphere of influence to make decisions, good or bad, uh, on their own and you know, within their own uh, uh, jurisdiction. It is the dilution of that notion of autonomy that at least in my mind is conjured by the part of the May 20th, 2020 decision, which takes autonomous power away from uh, uh, the people uh, of Hong Kong and their judiciary to determine what kinds of um, uh, uh, action, what kinds of state action do or do not conform uh, to their rights is that's the thing that's so pernicious and so um, uh, poisonous to me. And I'll just say by conclusion that, you know, uh, with Martin and, and, and maybe Sharon and maybe even uh, uh, Louisa, we look back with nostalgia at the uh, former 2003 Article 23 struggle because then we said, okay, Hong Kong's legislating its national security legislation. We got some doubts about the courts. We have big doubts about the LegCo as to how democratic it is and how it's able to build into the, the national security legislation that it's gonna deliver, uh, in you know, basic rights protections and caveats, et cetera, et cetera. I look back then, I look back at the struggle and you know, sort of be careful what you wish for because we got what we wanted. We got no national security legislation. But now we've got this thing that's coming back with a real vengeance. Now we have legislation apparently, which will be directly applied from the sovereign in Beijing, which moves aside all those quaint concerns about the representativeness of the legislature or the accountability of the courts. And in my mind, at least, uh, 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 posits a, a really much more uh, oppressive and autonomy depriving picture. So that's it, thank you all. Thank you so much, Nico, and as promised, very invigorating, wonderful talk. Um, all right, so it is now time for us to move to our Q&A session, and there's been a uh, massive rush of, Q of questions towards the end, but I'm going to start with um, some of the earlier questions, and I'm grouping them into a few different categories. So one of them I'm going to call a what's going to happen, uh, another one is um, sort of outcomes of colonialism and empiricism and how do we understand this and um, there are a number of questions as well about um, the relationship between the basic law, the NPC as you nicely addressed, and the international community and um, why would the international community have any bearing whatsoever on something that is um, already stated to be uh, uh, interpreted in the basic law. So I'm going to read the questions. Um, I will start uh, with um, two questions and I'm going to um, ask you to address them um, somewhat together because I think that they are um, similar. And these are really uh, questions towards Martin and Nico. So the first one is, if the basic law states that the um, NPC has the ultimate saying in interpreting the basic law, um, as Nico, you were talking about, um, whatever they are doing is legal. Why cite international law um, if the subject is the Hong Kong basic law? One can say that they don't agree with how it's interpreted um, and that doesn't mean that it violates the basic law. And why is this any different from how the US Supreme Court's ruling is considered to be final and not subject to 
international treaties. Martin, Martin, you go. <laughs> if you want to. Can't hear you. There we go. Uh, I'll leave the domestic uh, uh, answer to you, Nico, I think, uh, because you gave a just, I agreed with every word of your very clear presentation of uh, this, the domestic, uh, that is Hong Kong significance of uh, the new national, proposed national security law. Um, on the international side, uh, the basic argument is, and this was the gist of my remarks and Sharon's too, that uh, China has undertaken binding international obligations, both under its treaty with the United Kingdom and under the uh, ICCPR. Uh, and as Sharon said, uh, that applies to Hong Kong and more generally it applies to China because China is under a duty not to take steps to undermine the object and purpose of the treaty, as well as an array of other human rights treaties. So to use the Supreme Court example, yes, under domestic US law, the Constitution is supreme, although the Supreme Court really didn't get around to saying that until 1957. But the, the Constitution is supreme over international law. But if a decision of the United States Supreme Court places the United States in violation of its international obligations, I would expect and encourage the international community to condemn the United States for violating its solemn international undertakings. And that would be exactly the situation here. So that's the relevance on the international plane. Um, should I turn it over to you, Nico, about yeah, Article I'll just add two, two, two quick words, and I think Sharon's got a finger up, or two fingers up too. Uh, just to say that the, uh, the question is entirely correct, okay? Uh, that's the sad thing about the situation we face. It's entirely correct, but for the fact that in the basic law itself, the authority to make this comparison between, or to make this interpretation of the basic uh, law is delegated to the Court of Final Appeal and the Hong Kong courts by implication. Now, those of you who are Chinese speakers will hopefully note, or hopefully or you'll quickly note, that the Chinese words are shou quan, which means to delegate that power to the CFA. Now, any kind of power that is delegated to the Court of Final Appeal can be uh, ripped away by the, by the grand tour, right? I mean, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a session of that power. However, it's still there in the basic law. So uh, the promise under the basic law is that the Hong Kong judiciary has the ability to uh, uh, explicitly, with respect to the rights guarantees in the basic law, uh, interpret the basic law as against Hong Kong uh, government, uh, government action. And now, you know, uh, the questioner is exactly right. Oh, the sovereign in the PRC can say, oh, that was, that was then, we're going to change things. And that gets more to the world of Louisa and Sharon, uh, which are the political costs of doing that. Uh, we saw immediately in the right of abode cases, the, I think, negligible political costs of the NPC Standing Committee coming in and running roughshod over the CFA, even though they did it in a way that I think was really egged on by the Hong Kong executive. Uh, <laughs> they had to do something they didn't really want to do, but in any case, and I think we've seen a continuation of that pattern. And that expresses to me something else, which is really important for us talking about this issue at this time, which are what are the political costs now of the NPC Standing Committee doing this kind of thing? And that's where I think you've seen real change and real reaction in the international community, but also in Hong Kong and, and, and even in China. Sharon, please. Great, thank you. I wanted to jump in on um, the question that I hear it as, so what about international law? This is a basic, you know, this is a domestic law. And I wanted to point out that it's not just that they have the obligation. The obligation is quite specific. It's not a moral or a political obligation. It's not like this would be good if you respected rights. It's very specifically articulated as the right to respect, promote, and fulfill. So they're very specific with very specific standards. And the implementing body specifically for the ICCPR is the UN Human Rights Committee. And that committee has had regular every, you know, cycle of reviews. And they have concluded in these reviews that the actions of the Hong Kong SAR government are not fulfilling their obligations, are not 
promoting genuine universal suffrage. And they've also issued very specific recommendations. So the last review in 2014, they said, you must take concrete steps to ensure that there is you know, a, a, a genuine meaningful participation. You must make sure, and they express specific concerns about the disqualifications, the DQs, specific concerns about the election issues, and specific concerns that in violation of international norms, that you cannot make political party affiliation a condition or a obstacle to running for office. So I wanted to point out that this is part of another technical uh, 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 system that is systematic, that has mechanisms, that has norms, that has a jurisprudence. Unfortunately, the enforcement of that is really tied into the political will of the state party. So that if the Hong Kong SAR government, which is what they did in the last round, said, we're doing our best, and this is what we did. And literally, it went back and forth, as you know, Martin knows, in the follow-up procedure. Um, the, the committee said, no, this isn't good enough. And actually, Professor Philip Alston at NYU actually created a, a, a grading system. So Hong Kong's responses to implementing its own obligations got graded, and they got things like a C and a D on some of their responses. So I wanted to point out that number one, it's not just like, do it if you feel like it, that there actually is a concrete mechanism, and that procedure is coming up and Hong Kong civil society has already done an amazing job of submitting very detailed documentation analysis of almost every single issue we have discussed today. Um, so I wanted to say, uh, comment, uh, maybe engage Nico, is that I, I really, apropos of what I just said, I think there's actually less of a, a debate normatively about what democratization means, because in fact, the international standards are quite specific of what that means in terms of voting. And these are elaborated in the jurisprudence of the committee by the general comments, by the interpretations, et cetera, et cetera. And they actually all uh, address very specifically why the Hong Kong SAR government has failed to comply with those specific standards, primarily for lay people because it has politicized its implementation of the, the, the implant. So I have a question for Nico, if that's okay now, uh, is that um, I think when we talk about law, what we're not, no one is saying, is, and I'd like us to look at that, particularly as lawyers and non-lawyers, is that we're assuming that we're talking about the same thing. That, that you say law, Martin says law, Beijing says law. No, we're not talking about the same thing. And I think there is a dangerous, ongoing pattern of ignoring what Xi Jinping, what the party state, what the party policy, what the uh, the, the high Supreme People's Court judge, what they're saying in black and white to the international community, and this is what they've been saying for more than a decade. What we mean by law is not rule of law. And even more specifically, recently, we specifically reject Western as Western models of rule of law, independent courts, independent judiciary, and independent bar, etc. And they've specifically said, we are yi fa zhi huo. We are ruling the country by law. And that's what they're trying to do in, they're doing in Hong Kong. Ruling the country by law, whether you like it or not, is not in conformity with an international standard on what a rule of law is with due process protections and with these independent mechanisms of the legal system, because the, the system in China has by constitution, in the constitution and in policy documents issued by the party has very specifically said, your loyalty, judges, lawyers, prosecutors, media, educators, everybody, your loyalty, numero uno, is to the party. And that's why they're trying to expand that to say to Hong Kong, you won't sing the national anthem. You're going to be the only football league in the history of FIFA in 2015 to get fined because you're booing the national anthem. You, they're trying to legislate loyalty in Hong Kong because they did it in the mainland, that they could say you must, by constitution and by law and by national security law, you must be loyal to the party or i.e. Xi Jinping thought. So I feel like that is not just a political observation. That is a fact of, of that has been put out as what Beijing says is what we mean. And what has also been a great concern to me is why we don't tackle that straight on. Otherwise, the conversation sounds to me like, in the US context, except for that, Mrs. Lincoln, did you enjoy the show? <laughs>
So I think it's like the key. Like, what are we going to say when the emperor says, I have no clothes? So deal with it, and I don't care, like what you say. They're saying, we have no rule of law. Deal with it. So I think that's what I wanted to say. So I don't know if you had a response, Nico, or shall, if we want to just end there and move on to a different category of question. I, I, think, I think you probably want to move on, but just to say, of course, if the question is, is there a different political legal system in China versus Hong Kong and rest of the world, different parts of the world? Absolutely, right? Uh, the question that we're grappling with uh, and that Sharon brings up is, to what extent is that system that is specific to China being imposed in some way upon Hong Kong after the handover. And that's why we're just having this discussion today. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna move to a different topic and I'm going to start with Louisa actually. So this is about um, sort of what's going to happen. And we're gonna come back around to a similar uh, category of questions, but I'm gonna um, read from a couple of different questions, uh, which I think are really interesting. So um, one of them is, uh, you know, what is Beijing's end game? What does Beijing want from Hong Kong and what is its vision of the future for Hong Kong's integration? Um, a second uh, question in that category, uh, again, what do you think is going to happen with Hong Kong? And I'm quoting, I don't see China's belief towards democracy will change in the future and Chinese people will not side with Hong Kong, end quote. The third question, and I'm sorry, Louisa, I don't want to embarrass you, but I think that they uh, come together in an interesting way. The third question in this category is what do you think the outcome would be if the PRC would be willing to negotiate with people who want political reform? Well, thank you. Thank you for all those questions. Um, I guess we can start with the third question as that's pretty easily answered in that we've seen absolutely no sign that the People's Republic of China or indeed even the Hong Kong government is willing to even hold meaningful discussions with people who want political reform. Um, it is not, uh, notable that the Carrie Lam, the chief executive, at one point she said that she would listen, but she, I think, held one exercise, which where the majority of the people who commented brought up their concerns, their worries, and there was, there was no government response at all. Um, so what we have seen on a local level in Hong Kong is a real kind of absence of governance, almost a disappearing government, where really the only interface between the government and the people is the police. And the, the, the tool of interfacing is violence. And I mean, you know, it, it's put the police in a very invidious position and a position that perhaps could have been avoided had there been some meaningful uh, concessions or even just the proper talks. Um, when it comes to Beijing, we are, again, there's, there's no meaningful sort of political reform camp anymore. You know, we used to talk about factions amongst the leadership, but all of those factions have kind of collapsed as far as we can see. So I, I don't really see any, any sign of that um, being any, having any likelihood. I mean, you know, for me, what I look at is I look at China's messaging, and I think this is also something that somebody else asked a question about Xinjiang. And, you know, one of the things that I think might lead us towards one possible end game, and it's really, really worrying, is, is the, the, the rhetoric that is being used by Beijing about Hong Kong and the extent to which that parallels the rhetoric that has been used about Xinjiang. You know, as early as August, uh, uh, um, propaganda, you know, newspapers and Xinhua were talking about the protests of um, showing signs of terrorism. And then when there was um, the uh, siege of the universities, the Polytechnic U and CUHK, they talked again about the universities as, as fortresses of terrorism. Um, so that, you know, even the mention of terrorism in Hong Kong, I think is, is deeply alarming, but we also saw this kind of 
the language of uh, disease being used in both Xinjiang and in, and in, and in Hong Kong. This, I, um, you know, these, I, these ideas that, um, uh, that Western style liberal democracy is, is, is a malignant virus, it's an infection. And I think this really reflects Beijing's fear that, you know, the body politic could be infected and not uh, by, by the desire for democracy. And then uh, again, where we saw some of the same kind of language emerging is this sort of dehumanizing language, these references to protesters as cockroaches and things like that. So what, what, what does it mean about possible outcomes? I mean, you know, we, we see, you know, back when they started talking about, you know, the, when this language first started emerging it, in the middle of last year, you know, I don't think anyone would have thought we would be seeing national security legislation imposed in this way. Uh, you know, I think we're likely to see ideological campaigns. We've seen sort of a huge ideological tightening in, in Hong Kong. Um, you know, the last horribly symbolic thing that I saw was this sort of placing turnstiles on the university. So stopping people from going in and out of the universities, you know, in a place like Hong Kong, which is, you know, where academic freedom has been at the core and the sort of free traffic of ideas is fundamental to Hong Kongers. I think that's, that's very, very worrying. Um, so if you ask what is Beijing's end game, I mean, I think it de depends from which angle you look at it, but the political end game is probably, I would say that sort of stability maintenance is going to be a core concern. Um, their economic end game is, you know, the Great Bay Area, the integration of Hong Kong into a much larger economic entity, which will encompass sort of Shenzhen and Zhuhai, I think it's seven cities and Macau as well. Um, and, you know, will it, is there a move that Hong Kong should be just another Chinese city? I mean, I, I guess one way of looking at it also is, is the demographic end game where we've seen 150 migrants, mainland migrants a day uh, being given right of abode in Hong Kong. So since the handover, that's more than a million people. And um, I've heard a lot of Hong Kong people talking about this kind of idea of sort of Hong Kong as a goldfish bowl where you could keep the bowl and change the fish. It, could that be, you know, could that be the greater Bay Area with a sort of newly compliant population, you know, those people leaving, could that be Beijing's end game? It's really, really hard to tell. I mean, I think there have always been those who've thought that Hong Kong could be saved by its role as an international business center. But of course, that depends very, very highly on having a functioning rule of law, which is impartially sort of meted out. And um, it is notable that even before the handover, there were people quite close to the Chinese government, um, like uh, Vincent Lowe, who was then the chairman of the General Chamber of Commerce, who said, um, never think that China won't kill that golden goose. So I don't know what Beijing's endgame is, but all the various options at the moment are not looking good for Hong Kong. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh actually move to the golden goose question. Um, there are a number of questions about uh, Hong Kong's economy specifically. And um, so one is hedge funds moving out of Hong Kong. What should the response be of financial institutions around the world? We talked about um, legal uh, international um, obligations, but what about financial institutions? Um, and the other question is about uh, US potential revocation of Hong Kong's special status and how whether or not U.S. sanctions may be possible in the future and how China would view such sanctions. And there's a third question, but I think that's quite a big one. So um, I'm holding that open for anyone. Martin, do you have some thoughts on that? Or maybe Sharon too, because she's mm -hmm. yeah. talking to those institutions. 
Yeah. Uh, do you want to go first, Sharon, or I can go? So, you know, uh, this is just a, a, a general answer with regard to the United States, which is, um, interestingly, one of the last bastions of bipartisanship in the U.S. is with regard to China, um, uh, both as a function of Xinjiang and Hong Kong. Uh, late last year, Congress passed uh, statutes of both uh, with regard to uh, human rights in Hong Kong and human rights in, in Xinjiang with regard to the Uyghurs. And um, so those uh, laws, especially the Hong Kong law, has various provisions that the U.S. can take. And then there are other uh, mechanisms that the president has um, uh, to use in response. And one thing that the administration has uh, talked about is uh, revoking Hong Kong's special status with regard to tariffs uh, and duties and making it, uh, treating it essentially as it would treat China. And then you put that in the context of the trade war with China. Now, when it comes to the use of any sort of sanctions and economic sanctions, you know, my view would be what do the people of Hong Kong want with regard to that? Um, and I would defer to the others there. I will say that the one problem with sanctions is sometimes they hurt the very people you want to help. But then again, other times sanctions uh, are desired, notwithstanding the fact that in the short term you're hurting people. Nelson Mandela actually applauded the United Nations for imposing sanctions on South Africa, even though in the short term, those sanctions probably hurt everyone in South Africa with regard to the economy. So that's with that. My larger issue is the United States, both in certainly in terms of, of uh, its moral standing, um, but even with regard to the efficacy of its uh, resort to international law and standards, has for fairly obvious reasons lost its, uh, the stature that it once had. Um, as I say, it becomes very hard to uh, take seriously condemnations of police violence in Hong Kong when you're uh, effectively supporting it and trying to call in the military in the United States. Now, I think there are two consequences to that. One is just the fact that hypocrisy undermines that. But I think a much more pernicious effect of kind of the evident double standards of this administration is it feeds into this narrative that both Beijing and the SIR government are trying to peddle, which is that the only reason for unrest in Hong Kong is because of evil foreign influence. And so it makes that charge much more plausible, you know, when you've got the US condemning street violence uh, and heavy handed police tactics in Hong Kong and allowing what's going on here to go on. So that's a huge problem and will be, you know, at least until next January, we'll see what happens. So can I follow up Martin uh, yeah, yeah. quickly? Yeah. Um, I think that um, for governments and in terms of the finance sector that you were asking is that it's clearly that all the governments that have been concerned now, the US, the UK, and some of the other EU member states, um, they're concerned because they are protecting their own national interests. That is their businesses and for like the US over several hundred thousand of uh, their nationals living there. or um, So the governments are, are protecting exactly their reactions now is precisely because they perceive this effort to uh, the, the decision as really implicating um, a, a risky environment, a rule of law environment for their businesses and for their citizens. And then also a consistency with their uh, articulated national uh, values. What Martin was saying about that the, um, the sanctions but we, we think it's really important that, that there's not a unified view on that among the Hong Kong movement. There are people who are saying, do it. Other people saying, don't hurt the local, you know, et cetera. But the, the, the thing about that is the U.S. needs to lead by example. And I think mm -hmm. from the perspective of the movement, we need to be careful that we as the movement people or those of us who support the movement do not get sucked into a state-centric debate like you're guilty, no, you're guilty, no, you're more guilty, because that's just them hijacking 
a problem that both states have. And with police violence, it happens to be not only a problem in Hong Kong, not only in the US, but in the whole world. And that's why the death, the killing of George Floyd has sparked a worldwide global because police or state sanctioned violence with impunity exists in the world. And I think the message that we, as in terms of those who care about law and rights, should not get sucked into the hostaging of that state centric, because they're manipulating and using the narrative for their own geopolitical purposes, which frankly, we have a different perspective. And our perspective is the US authorities need to make the police accountable. They need to have police reforms in the US. The Hong Kong authority must make the Hong Kong police not only comply with the Hong Kong police manual, but with the international standards on use of force by law enforcement, of which they are not doing and they're not doing in the US. And the way that people who are talking about these violence issues is if you really care about it, not for geopolitical capital, but for ending the violence, you do what is happening around the world. We address the causes. And in the US, it is a systemic centuries old racism. It is inequality. It is, and that is in Hong Kong, the violence has to do with a fundamental trampling on rights promised and the trampling on the rights. And so I think we need to move away from that narrative of if you're guilty, no, you're guilty. And I wanted to add to what Louisa was saying is that the disappearance of local government, you said it very generously. We might say it's a total collapse of competency and, and, and a political total cluelessness, but it is also an expansion of mainland direct, not just in the law, as Nico said, it is an expansion of the direct interface with mainland entities. The, the Zhong Lianban, the liaison office in Hong Kong has come up front and center and directly giving orders. The security organs that have been behind the scenes threatening or either moving in more in Shenzhen, they are now moving more prominent. So I think that's the second thing about the expansion is that you have these. And then finally, I just want to get my two cents in on the end game. I think that the um, end game will cannot be unilaterally determined by Beijing's wish list or its vision of what they think the end game will be, which I think is accurately described by Louisa. That's what they hope the end game will be, the integration, et cetera. But I do feel in terms of the outcome of what is happening with the movement, the future isn't written yet. And I think that future is being, that is the crux of what's happening in the movement is that different parts of the movement are now struggling to both expand the civil space and they're, they're debating among themselves and envisioning that alternative outcome. But the first step is to have a space where they can even envision that because we know what happened if you try to envision an alternative political future on the mainland, Charter 08, full stop. If you try to do that, that's what will happen, is what happened to Liu Xiaobo, you know, to, to have the only Nobel Peace Prize laureate to be killed while in detention. So I, I do think that the answers to all these questions, it's very important to keep in mind that there is a very dynamic, resilient, creative, maybe not visible to the naked eye from the outside or any other of that, but it is definitely on the grassroots level, alive and, and, and diverse and, and and, and really, uh, I think that's what we have to figure out, how to support that when we talk about sanctions and we talk about all these other uh, interventions by uh, Western democratic governments, you know. Thank you, Sharon. I'm gonna, um, I know, Nico, you have a comment too, but I'm gonna actually ask you a very direct um, question that follows from what you just said. And that is a question that came out about, um, how to help the protesters who have been imprisoned and detained or um, charged, given that they don't feel that they have will have the possibility of a fair trial. That's to me. That's to you, but okay. actually so, everybody else. But it, it comes out, and I know Nico, I have not forgotten you. So first of all, that that is already being dealt with. They don't have enough resource, but the um, the bar in Hong Kong, uh, the Progressive Glorious Groups, the Bar Association, all of them since the beginning of the arrest have organized to represent those arrested and they're stretched very, very thin. Uh, Denise Ho, uh, Canto Pop star and activist, and uh, Margaret Eng, who's now one of the 15 arrested, many people have organized crowdsourced funding 
to support the defense of those arrested. So I think that reflects the public support for the, 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 the protesters being arrested. So number one, locally, because you really need to have the local representation, there's a tremendous organizing effort to ensure, and I think that those poor lawyers are, 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 are really, really exhausted, stretched thin. How can we support them? Some people are saying, should we donate funds? Should we do that? I leave that to the groups locally who say, do they want it or do they not, particularly at this moment? Uh, I think that, so that is happening in terms of supporting the defense of the protesters. I think the other things that's happening is some of the protesters who have been subjected to like uh, uh, rape while in detention by the, in the police station or being um, really tortured, they are now with legal representation uh, 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 bringing legal actions so that they can try to get the evidence and get some accountability because that's the only way you're going to stop uh, the, the, the abuse. In the US, you know, a uh, charge with second degree murder because you've been documenting as really killing and the police who did nothing are being charged with complicity in the murder. So I think some of that is happening in Hong Kong is that cases are, are beginning to be brought and that is how people can support it by being aware of it, learning about it. And if there are petitions, if there are anything you can do to support that. And then in terms of financial support, I would leave that only to the groups that are crowdsourcing and under the conditions in which the local groups say they want foreign financial support or not, because I think that's something they need to calibrate. So uh, Nico had a comment and Martin, I see you as well. Louise, I saw your pen. I wasn't sure if you were as well, but um, start with Nico. Thank you. So just a very quick, uh, can you hear me? Good. Just a very quick footnote to uh, something that Louisa raised. Uh, she said, you know, there, there was always this idea of uh, the PRC or the central people's government would never kill the golden goose that was Hong Kong as a, you know, source of financing SOEs. And, you know, before that, just trade into China. Um, I just want to note, you know, uh, my impression of, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, in, in Beijing, Shanghai, Chongqing, those kinds of places. There is, and we, I think we need to confront it, there's a lot of hostility inside the PRC towards Hong Kong and the people of Hong Kong. Uh, you could even say there's a lot of support for some of the postures uh, insofar as they're understood that are now being made apparent. And on this idea of uh, Hong Kong being the golden goose that no one would disturb, you know, recently, I'm gonna say in the last decade, I get a completely different vision. There's A, this idea of the Great, the, the great Bay development, which is of course meant to aggregate, uh, you know, Zhuhai and Shenzhen and, and Hong Kong, but it also dilutes Hong Kong's power. But even quite remarkably, and I say remarkably because this is coming from Beijing, a new affection for Shanghai as the forthcoming financial center. And for those of you who spend time in China, you know how remarkable it is that anyone in Beijing cares for the development of Shanghai. The status quo anti-posture towards Shanghai has been to keep it under control and to stop its development. But now when it's compared with uh, what people, and this is including officials, what they want for Hong Kong, it may have changed significantly. So that's something we should factor into as we discuss the golden goose theory. Thank you. All right, um, Martin, we are at seven o'clock, um, but I will let you uh, have your comment. And then um, Louisa, did you have a comment on that as well? Okay, so we'll start with Martin, go to Louisa, and then we're gonna have to wrap up. So two super quick points. One is, uh, one thing I would add to what Sharon said is one thing the international legal community can do and what it's been doing really ever since the handover is monitor and keep a close eye and publicize what's going on. That's one thing the New York City Bar Association is doing. So is the International Bar Association, Law Society of England and Wales, et cetera. So that's one thing that lawyers, if this is a predominantly US and US legal audience can do and get involved that way. Uh, more broadly, another thing that I just think worth, is worth noting in terms of where things have been and where they may be going is Xi Jinping. Um, I don't want to wax nostalgic about Hu Jintao and Zhang Zemin, but you know the fact remains that things have taken a very authoritarian turn, even by PRC standards, since uh, Xi Jinping uh, took office as now permanent president and also chair of the uh, CCP. And that's been evident in a range of things in terms of Chinese foreign policy, as well as domestic crackdowns, not least detaining or incarcerating a million Uyghurs in concentration camps. So the question is, you know, how long will that turn away from the law and end of reform last? 
Um, so I'm afraid that in large part, Hong Kong's fate may well depend on ultimately Xi Jinping's fate. Thank you, Louisa. I was just going to make a quick comment in response to the question about Western businesses and what they could do or what they are doing. I mean, we've actually seen very high levels of concern. I think it was a, just an AmCham survey in Hong Kong where 80, more than 80% of respondents said they were moderately or very concerned about what's happening. But actually what we've seen has pretty much been businesses just falling into line, all the tycoons in Hong Kong, HSBC, Standard Chartered, all the big banks coming out and um, having to vocally uh, state their support of national security legislation. And I think, um, you know, Western businesses should be concerned about what's happening there. I guess uh, one company that's really been a bellwether for this is Cafe Pacific, um, which is, of course, headquartered in Hong Kong. But uh, when the protests began, the chairman of Cafe Pacific was known for saying that he wouldn't dream of telling his employees what to think. Well, he lasted, you know, barely a week, I think, after he said that. And eventually, the chairman who'd been there more than 30 years, John Slosa, had, had to step down, has been changed for another chairman. And the company handed over several of its employees, um, you know, who there was a pilot who had made a comment in support of demonstrators who was handed over. And it's come out, you know, very firmly in support of national security legislation. And now we see just in the last couple of days, it got a $5 million bailout from the Hong Kong government. So I think many businesses are really falling in line because they see their economic survival as necessitating this oath of loyalty. Um, and you know, this, is, this is going to be an issue. I mean, what can people do about it? I, I would say that when you talk to people in Hong Kong, when you talk to people inside the movement, one of their biggest fears is that Hong Kong is fa falling off the map. It's falling from the news. Events around the world are just pushing it completely off the agenda. And this is the opportunity for Beijing to push through all kinds of things. So one way of, you know, uh, making a difference is really monitoring, not just as Martin says, as an illegal sense, but, you know, trying to ensure that the, that people are noticing what is happening there uh, and that it, that it is talked about uh, and not just seeing it as a problem for Hong Kong, but I think as everyone has said on this panel, to see this as a, you know, much larger problem that, you know, we all kind of need to, to some extent, take ownership or, or address, because it is a problem that ultimately will not end uh, inside Hong Kong. Thank you so much. And on that note, um, I greatly appreciate all of you addressing this question and being very thoughtful and active throughout your careers um, with Hong Kong and China and uh, the US. And I think we are, actually over our time. So thank you all. There are more questions and I deeply apologize that we are simply out of time and cannot answer them. But thank you very, very much for attending.